as I'm continuing, um, I apparently a spirit turned off the camera, so they didn't want the public to hear this, but they're going to hear it anyway. Through a person might encounter a God in a dream, there was the fear that while unconscious, demons or ghosts might enter the bedroom uninvited, sometimes even sexually assaulting a person. They could also terrorize a sleeper in his dreams. For this reason, the images of Bess and Tourette were placed around the bedroom and used to decorate head, head rest. Vulnerable parts of the house might be associated with gods. For example, the doorbell, the door bolts might be assigned to Pata, Puta, while the four noble ladies normally at the four corners of a Sacrobagus would be called on to protect the four corners of the bed. The Egyptian placed a Uraeus wearing rearing cobra to rearing cobra of pure clay with fire in its mouth in each corner of the bedroom to fight off nightmares and demons. Special steli used to ward off snakes and scorpions and to heal those attacked by them were hung from walls. Even King Amenhotep the third's bedroom at Malkata in Western Thebes was protected with images of Bess, while the ceiling was painted with the goddess Nephet as a vulture with her wings outstretched. Seth created the elements from which nightmares were born to scare away such night terrors, magical rituals would be performed, which served as protections for all evil forces that might sit upon a person. The idea of a demon sitting upon a person during the night is found across the globe and describe the feelings of being paralyzed or crushed during sleep paralysis and nightmares. In Chinese culture, for example, a ghost, a ghost is thought to press upon the body while in some Muslim countries, it is interpreted as caused by evil jinn. In Egyptian today, on the West Bank at Luxor, Luxor such beings are called Quabus. In these spells, such as those in the Book of Driving Out, now P. Linden, 1348 V2, a person associated himself with various gods such as a tomb or played the role of Horus, God, such as Osiris or Sia, could also be called upon the assistance. Demons were told to turn away so that the evil eye could not fall upon the sleeper. <laughs> oh man. Magic and mythology. Magic in one form or another thus played an important role in the daily life of the Egyptian. In its most basic form, individuals used amulets of Bess or Tourette to ward off evil forces. And the majority of the population probably knew 
simple spells to influence the world around them as they went about their daily business. For more complex problems, however, it was normal to call on a professional, a lector priest, a person learned in the magic text who would arrive and perform powerful rituals. Because of their special powers, lector priests are frequent characters in literary tales. They reconnect severed heads, turn wax, animals into true animals, part the sea and amunate clay men. In reality, they were learned literate individuals associated with the temples who had access to a vast corpse of spells and conducted their magic in a rather peculiar manner. By imitating the gods, if you called upon to perform a ritual, the lector priest would announce that he had power over the gods and that he and that they should do as he wished or else he bring back chaos. The sky will no longer exist. The earth will no longer exist. One spell reads, the five days and complete the year will no longer exist. The sun will no longer shine. The inundations that come at its time will no longer rise. Simultaneously, the priest completed associates himself with the gods, announcing, for example, that he is Horus, or he is Thoth. By becoming fully absorbed by God, the priest would gain the same influence that the divine possess over the cosmos. Many mythology, mythological references are found in Egyptian spells by connecting the present situation, often an illness, with a myth mythological precedent that the spell gained authority. The idea began that if the spell benefited God in the past, it would be just as beneficial in the present. Often a spell derived this mythological authority from tales of Isis and Horus, the child, when they were hiding from Seth. One such spell meant to relieve bodily pains, identified the sufferer with Horus before detailing the instructions for his magical remedy. Certain mythological accounts of Horus, the child began poisoned or stung by needling protection from snakes and scorpions are recorded on steli known as sepi. These stelis were covered in magical spells and depicted Horus the child holding dangerous animals and standing on the backs of crocodiles. The ritualist, the ritualist poured water over the inscriptions, which ran over the spells and absorbed their power. The water was then drunk, so the magic entered the body. Demons and ghosts. Because ghosts and demons are thought to cause illnesses, magic was also used to fight them off and people wore amulets of segment to repel them. Garlic, gold, spit, and beer, as well as the more unusual gallbladder of a turtoise were also regarded as effective against demons and ghosts. Behaving more as emissaries for important gods Demons were usually dispatched by their divine masters to perform specific tasks such as punishing cultic infractions. 
they inhabited locations that served as a connection between the dot and the living realm, such as pools of water, where one might find a malevolent demon called the Warret, a great one. Tombs and caves. Demons are normally depicted as nines, welding snakes, crocodiles, or bulls with human bodies, while others could be moving more terrifyingly evoked. As Shaket, whose eyes are in his head, whose tongue is in his anus, who eats the bread of his buttlock, his right paw turning away from him, his left paw crossing over his brow, who lives on Doug, who the gods in the necro necropolis fear. Wandering demons, Shemayu, and passerbys, Swa, could cause infectious diseases by demons, could also be sent by the gods to possess people. The demonic tale of Inarus, Osiris sends the demon strike, strife lover, and horrors, Nemes. The messies to create strife in the heart of Pame the Younger, the son of Inaros, against Ret Tai Mont Nut, the son of Inaros. They enter into Pame, while he sits at festivals with 40 of his men, causing him to forget the festival and suddenly want to fight, wrongly believing himself to be inspired by the god Atum. Ghosts were also a source of trouble for the living, as one text, the instructions of Ani reads, appease the spirit do not he like, refrain from all that disguise him. May you be preserved from his many misdeeds, for every form of harm comes from him. A beast led away from the field. It is he who does not, who does such things, damage on the threshing floor in the fields. In its spirit, the one says again, Tempest is tempest in the house, heart and strange, all that is doing, the instruction of Ani. Somebody's sick to their I hear somebody just throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. Somebody very sick. Ghosts both friendly and malevolent, like demons were all accepted parts of the mythic landscape of ancient Egypt. Interactions with the dead was an expected part of life. Ideally, at the end of each week, a person from an Egyptian household brought food and drink to the temples and grave of ancestors at the cemetery. During the beautiful festival, of the valley held annually, the thieves' family went to Necropolis to dine in the tomb chapels with the dead, leaving offerings at the tomb either for ancestors or re owned individuals. Though on the fringes, of the settlement, the dead remain part of the community eternally. If a person wished to com communicate with a deceased individual, he could write a letter to the dead. 
such compositions were often written in ink on the side of offering bowls and left at the tomb. Once the deceased had consumed the offering, he couldn't help but notice the message left for him. Using this cunning technique, the living could ask for help from their dead parents, including their message, message reminders of favors done in life as not subtle guilt trips or blame the disease for problems. Indeed, if a person suspected that the suspected that the magnolent influence of a dead relative was behind recent troubles, he could even threaten to take up matter with person with the court of Osiris in Dua. In some cases, a recent deceased person could be contacted in order to reach an individual that had been dead much longer. In Egyptian conception of the world, it was Ankh, transfigured spirit or blessed dead who had passed Osiris's judgment that came closest to the modern meaning of ghost. Aku had unrestricted access to all parts of the created world and if they wished could haunt the ne necropolis, they regarded the tomb as their home and could be summoned against enemies. They might also enter a person's home cause nightmares and create trouble if irritated. Those who failed to reach the judgment hall of Osiris, who died violently or young, were executed by the state or had not received proper funerary, funerary rituals, were however classed as mutt, unjustified, dead. These were the worst form of evil dead and are sometimes referred as the damned. Like the Aku, they could also cause trouble for the living and were thought to take children away from their parents. The Egyptians also feared enemies and adversaries names given to groups of divine invaders from the Duat, who could enter the land of the living to imitate and cause intimidate and cause problems. Such beings could occupy a person's body causing sickness and bleeding or use their influence to generate problems. In particular, an entity named Nessie caused fever. Such belief in contact with the dead was not shared by all Egyptians. However, as the famous Harper song relates, none come back from their dead to tell of their state, to tell of their need to calm our hearts until we go where they have gone. A number of tales retail, tales relating and at activities of God have been preserved through many are fragment Terry. In the tale of Pasti, for example, known as the fragmentary demonic papyri and probably composed in the first century AD, Pasti, a priest of a tomb, encounters a ghost of a tomb in its courtyard of Heliopolis while perhaps it isn't clear, searching for a wise man to cure his illness. The two walk hand in hand in the ghost laughs as they walk, but in irrespective of all well they were getting on, when Pastis asked the ghost how long he has left 
he has left to live. He is simply told to complete his years on earth. Angered, Pesty casts a spell on the ghost. Only only says that it is simple to say. Changing tax, Pesty decides to use the ghost as an intermediary between himself and Osiris, hoping that the king of the blessed dead might be able to provide some answers. But Pesty's insistence on getting his answer and his refusal to leave the god's presence until he does so enrages Osiris. And the ghost finally relents, telling him that he only has 40 days left to live, apparently a divine punishment for stealing gold and silver that belonged to Isis. Distraught Pesty returns home to tell his wife the bad news. He then sleeps with her and spends the next five days of his increasing short life arguing with his fellow priests for 50 silver pieces probably compensations for their role in his misfortune to pay for his comp to pay for his burial as before he eventually gets his way he then creates a group of magical beings charged with helping him to write down 35 and 35 35 good and 35 bad one bad, one good for each remaining day of his life. These are not made to entertain him in his dying days, but as a gift to Pestis to prosperity. After Pestis death at the end of his remaining 35 days, he is buried and his widow makes offering to Re, the sun god, then speaks to her in Pestis voice so that his words directly enter her heart, although the remainder of the tale is fragmentary. It is possible that it ended with re resurrecting Pesti so that he was reunited with his wife. In the demonic tale of Setna, Ka, I don't even know how to say these words, K. Swatset and the mummies copied until P. Cairo 30,646 30, in the early Platonic period. Prince and their son Merak in the Mephodite necropolis while searching for the magical secret scroll of thought in life net oh my god these words nanefercata pot had discovered his secret scroll in a chest at the bottom of a lake in Coptos but in doing so had in occurred the wrath of Thoth, who prefers to keep his secret scroll secret. To punish the plunderers, Seth sent a slaughtering demon to cause him, his wife and child to drown in the Nile. And afterwards, although Nekepta was taken to be buried in Memphis, his wife and son were entered in a tomb at Coptos, forever separating the family's physical remains. Dismissing the ghost tale of woe and ignoring the potential for an angering thought, Setna demands that Nanefrikata hand over the scroll but he refuses, asking instead that Setna win its fairly from him over a board game.
Setna duly loses each game, and with each loss, Nanifurkata takes plate takes the game board and hammers Setna into getting desperate. Setna calls for help from his foster brother, who is who brings magical amulets that enables him to fly up from the ground and steal the scroll out of Nefekert's hands. In retribution, Nefekert ensures that misfortune follows Setna however he goes wherever he goes, so that eventually the humble prince returns the scroll to the tomb as an act of peasants. Setna travels to court to retrieve the bodies of Ahur and Merup. He finds their mummies beneath the southern corner of the house of the chief of police and brings them back to Memphis to be entered with Nanefurkatpata reuniting the family. I really do not know how to say that name. Hmm. Part three: the mythologic, myth, the mythology of death, are explaining the. The life hereafter. The trials of Duat, a guide. The Egyptian had a complex view of the individual in which a person was not simply a singular soul in a physical body, but multiple elements, each with their own distinct resonance. The Etri et and the Ka represented the person's life force and vitality. The Ba was personality and movement. The shadow existed <coughs> alongside the body in life, but at but was independent after death. The heart served as the seat of thought and consciousness. The name was fundamental to a person's identity and the physical body was an image of and vessel for the person. These corporal and spiritual building blocks were integrated into the whole and were incapable of operating alone at least during life death you sleep that you may awake you die that you may live pyramid text 1975b at death when the body was deprived from the breath of life the component parts of the individual separated the person was the person as a unity integrated but the fates of the multiple parts remained entangled the loss of a single element of the individual meant the second death of the whole. So all had to be cared for and protected. The car remained it perpetually in the tomb, requiring substance to survive, while the Ba flew to the afterlife realm of the Dwat to exist in the traditional phase between physical death and judgment. 
traveling from its point of entry to the judgment hall of Osiris. The body as an integral part of the deceased personality had to be preserved in order for the individual to remain whole. For this reason, the Egyptians developed mummification, reacting the procedure conducting by Anubis over the dead Osiris. In addition to the physical practice of mummification, purification was warded off with magic. Its destructive characters personified as the slayer, who kills the body, who rots the hidden one, who destroys a multitude of corpses, who live by killing the living. Incidentally, there is only one known depiction of death personified on the papyrus of Henutwe. Henu and it's away. BM 118. Death, the great God who made gods and men, is shown as winged four legged snakes with the head of a man and a tail terminating in a jackal's head. By preserving the body, the Egyptians ensured that their spiritual elements had a vessel to return to, a place to recharge and renew. Statues inscribed with the deceased name served as a similar purpose, acting as backup in case the body became unrecognizable or destroyed. The heart remains the body, the only internal organ to be left in place as it was needed at the final judgment. Without his heart, the deceased had no chance of joining the ranks of the vessel dead. Once preserved, the body had to be made habitable for the Ba again. This necess necessitated a ceremony called the opening of the mouth, which enabled the deceased to recover its functions, allowing him to eat and drink despite being dead. These rituals connected the separated aspects of the person and reanimated the body, reassuring his continued existence. He could now receive food offerings from the living, from relatives coming to spend time with the ancestors on festival days, or indeed any person who happens to be wandering by the tomb, chapel, and be tempted inside. If physical offerings could not be brought, tomb inscriptions listing them of food and drink could serve as a viable substitute, magically manifesting a veritable post-mortem feast by their very existence on the tomb wall. But not only could the deceased now eat and drink, he could also speak. This was particularly helpful for his ba, flung into the duat after death and questioning on a journey to be judged as he had to recite magical spells and announce the names of the dangerous denizens of the duat in order to gain power over them. The repetition of the deceased name by living also increases chance of survival. 
This is why the tomb inscriptions, the name is found again and again. On assistance of the name might fall with the lost plaster and shatter on the ground, but not hundreds. There were safe, safety in numbers. Wow, I just have to say this is like really touching a soul within my own being, understanding the Egyptians and how they lived and how they preserved to bring their energy back into existence. I am, and how to cure illnesses, how to fight off demons, demons through spell work because it does exist. They do do this to the public. They are doing this. And right now we're going through a big, big change on the planet. And those who have been doing this, their days of doing spells on the collective is numbered. This is the message I am receiving. And those who did any evil to a divine being and knew and continued every single day of their lives what they did to hurt and harm, judgment is upon you at this moment, at this time, right now. There is chaos in your life. There is chaos in your life. There is chaos in the government. There is chaos in all systems, in all, everybody who stirred the material world. There is chaos in your life. You chose a side. You chose a side of the material world versus a side of God, a God who will created the world who created you and you turn your back on him 